Greetings all and welcome to today's presentation, Innovation Quality for Tomorrow. This is a joint webinar between the ASQ Quality Management Division and Inspection Division. My name is Jair Aldana and I join you from San Antonio, Texas. Today's presenter is Tracy Owens. Tracy Owens is a master black belt. He is a business transformation leader who has driven his employers and clients organizations to achieve near-term objectives and better long-term results through our innovation and quality management. As an ASQ Certified Quality Engineer, Certified Manager of Quality and Organizational Excellence, he has strengthened operational capabilities and process improvements expertise among all the teams he has supported since 1998. As founding member of ASQ's Innovation Division, Tracy has promoted a growing body of knowledge on innovation management and brought his audience a strong message about innovation as a process and not just the creative spark. He is co-author of the Executive Guide to Innovation, which was published in 2013. Please, let's all welcome Tracy Owens. In order to be able to um, not miss anything, we want to turn over every stone. We want to talk to as many people as we can about what's working for you so that we can share that, and you'll help us cultivate that body of knowledge. So we need your input. We have, we have among our member leaders and our 1,300 members in our division already, we have a lot of knowledge. We have been um, successful in innovation management, but we need to learn more. We have lots more to learn. As Jair mentioned, please ask your questions at any time through the chat panel or the Q&A panel on the sides of the WebEx. Um, I, will, I should be able to see them and respond to them because of my screen. The way this works, this screen works, is, it's this host screen. I used to just do you know, share my screen, but several years ago I was presenting a webinar using share my screen and an email popped up and of course everyone was able to read it and that, you know, depending on what the subject matter. Now, for me at the time, it was ASQ Quality Press saying, congratulations, we've agreed to publish your book, Six Sigma Greenbelt Round 2. So it was quite positive, but it could have been something else that could have turned bad quickly. So I, I want to share with you uh, this um, uh, three-part presentation. I know I only have about 52 minutes or, or so, uh, but I think that'll, that'll uh, it'll break up um, nicely into three segments. If you've seen any bits of this before because you've been in the same room with me, I have updated uh, this material and I've consolidated it. There is an introductory section, which is section one. And then, as Jerry mentioned in, in my introduction a second ago, we want to look at, we want to look at innovation management as a process and not just a spark or a um, lark, you know, just something where, where, oh, we got lucky or that or that innovation is only the province of an R&D department. Our assertion that we've had from the beginning, which stems back to about 2009, uh, 2010 really, is that quality management professionals, quality professionals play an important role in innovation management for a couple of reasons. One, it's not just creativity, and I'll go into this. There is, there's gotta be execution as well. And that like any process, if you look at innovation management as a process, like any process, it can be improved. You don't have to just wait and hope uh, that somebody's going to come up with a great idea and it's going to turn into a million dollar winner. Innovation management, when viewed as a process, it can be improved. So I'm going to begin into this. Type your questions into the chat uh, panel as they arise. Um, but we uh, push. I, I, will, I will clip through some of these rather quickly. That that there is a need to do something new because your customer demands it, and because your competitors are looking for the new thing, and because competitors you haven't heard of yet are looking at the new thing. And I have a few examples of that, and I'm sure that you do as well. So that whatever that unmet need is, and it's maybe it may be an unmet need that we don't even know is a need today. That's uh, the the province of innovation is where is how to come up with a way to meet that unmet need. There are changes going on in our world and we've had um, you know, so much to keep up with over this last year and this last decade. Uh, but as Darwin said, it's not the most intelligent that will, that will survive, it's the ones that respond best to change. And I have a few quotes in here, Drucker and Edison, and there are some pioneers, but perhaps one day these presentations will quote Tracy Owens and Jim Spichiger and Jair Aldana and you know others on this on this call. Uh, this um, we started to build a slide like this one several years ago, where what we said at the top was camera and film, you know, like a Polaroid, put it under your arm and warm it up. Camera and film, and then to the right was digital photography. 
But that's old news now. And digital photography is old news. What's what's most interesting now is that as soon as you take that picture, everyone in the world can see it. That's that's how this has evolved. It used to say BlackBerry uh, PDA to iPhone, but now it's wearable. I mean, anything, and I can and I could go on. Diskette and Flash became. Um, um, yeah, Disket went to Flash, and now Disket and Flash goes to cloud. You don't even need a hardware, a device anymore. Banks and banks and loans. There is so much movement of money now that doesn't even, in some cases, doesn't even require a signature. And then taxi went to Uber, but the self-driving car is not far away. But how many of these were needs that we didn't even know we had? Did you know that you needed a Fitbit? I think that that market was created. Oh, we have, we've settled on a definition, and we want you to. Um, either you know, agree with us for the time being that this is a useful definition for innovation or help us to refine it and make it better. I'm going to stop the impassioned pleas for your input. I hopefully, hopefully I have made that clear at this point that we really want you to be involved in this body of knowledge. But what we've got is um, that innovation is the successful conversion of new knowledge into new products and services to enable new ways of doing things. In short, it's the conversion, why that's underlined is the conversion means you've got to realize it. It can't just be an idea. The idea itself is not the innovation. It's the delivery of that idea. And of course, we've got the word new in there three times. But it doesn't have to be new to the world. It could be new to your environment. And I'll talk about that more in section two of this um, workshop, which is on idea generation. And then section three will be on some engineering techniques, actually, that have been helpful in uh, quality management and innovation. So we got a few quotes, as I mentioned, Drucker and Ted Levitt, um, but it's really the execution that has to uh, has to bring that to market and start bringing value, or else it doesn't match with our definition of innovation. I got a couple of cycle cycles uh, to to show a couple of diagrams that are kind of cyclic. Innovation brings ideas to life after creativity comes up with an idea, and then another idea will be generated, and another idea, and this is a virtuous cycle. But I have several circular diagrams, which I'll show you. In 2013, the uh, ASQ World Conference was held in Indianapolis. There was the Indianapolis conference year. Many of you, I'm sure, were there. Prior to that, in the week leading up to the um, World Conference, ASQ World Conference on Quality and Innovation, I mean improvement, uh, we held what we call the Innovation Think Tank in 2013, and we invited uh, serial entrepreneurs. We invited uh, venture capital uh, managers. We invited you know numerous um, uh, participants on the topic, and they came up with several things. Two things. Two of the things that came up that the two of the two of the outputs. We had a chalk artist on the wall. It was really great. Two of the art, uh, artifacts that came out of that were these quotes and something I'll show you in a couple minutes, uh, which are some of the qualities of an innovator. And what we said is that when you view it as a process, innovation needs to be measured, and then thus I would. I'd, expand that to innovation can be improved. It is not just an R&D cell who does this. People need to play a role. And further, a suggestion box, a simple suggestion box is not enough. It needs to be uh, farmed, nurtured. In innovation, looking at it as a process, we've got another cyclic diagram, which really comprises two phases. The creativity phase, which begins in the top left. There's a yellow circle that says, find the opportunity, whatever that is. That's the spark. The idea that you have, ooh, I just thought of a winning idea. Hmm, wonder if I can turn it into something. And then connecting it to a solution, that green ball, is where you say, now this idea that I have, maybe I can find a way to actually bring value to our customers, to the customers of my organization. And that creativity phase, the top half of this diagram, could end with just a, a sketch on the back of a napkin. I know I've said that several times, but it, it, it's formless. It's, it's, um, it's a concept still with maybe just a few legs. The execution phase is where you, know, you would initially think, this is where the quality professional is really going to be able to add value. I mean, make it user-friendly. That sketch needs to turn into a plan. Who better to build a plan, a replicable, um, useful plan that can be measured and evaluated? And then getting it to market, the blue ball at the, at the um, bottom left, is about making sure that no, nothing will stand in the way of us delivering this new idea to market, this, this new solution to our market. So it takes all kinds of people. And I'll spend a minute on that. I'm going to open the, an opportunity for you to look at where you fit into where you might feel like you fit best into this cycle. I'll show you how to find that. 
So there are those who come up with an idea and those who implement that idea are what it takes for that idea to become real. Now, it could just be you. You could be the person who has the idea and who implements it and who, who, who creates that whole thing. It's a, bit of, it's a bit of stress, and it's not every person who can fulfill those two responsibilities. Normally, a team is – typically, a team is required in order to uh, realize these solutions, originators, implementers working together. Uh, there are myriad circle diagrams in this, to be sure, uh, but there are some improvements and, and – there are some improvements that can be made that are innovative. There are some improvements that can be made that are not innovative. I mean, a lot of lean techniques are about refining, you know, massaging the process map a little bit, not really doing anything new, just doing what you do in a better way. That's great. There are improvements that are not innovative. There are improvements that are innovative. And on the left side of this diagram, and this is borrowed from our 2013 book, The Executive Guide to Innovation, uh, which was written by me and four other founding members of the innovation division and we don't collect any royalties from it the royalties from that book go right back to the in innovation division uh, and it's still it's still it's still for sale in the asq bookstore uh, but on the left side of this in kind of a greenish darker shaded there are innovations that really that really don't improve anything do you know what i mean they, they the um, uh gosh what's a good example of an innovation that didn't improve anything well uh, first of all the chip card the chip card, the Visa card that had chip in it, while it was supposed to great bring better security, and maybe it did, but didn't it make transactions take longer? You and the cashier both are looking at that machine, waiting for it, waiting for it to beep at you. Like, eh, eh. That was not an improvement. And the next generation, actually the third generation, is when the approval started to become a lot more instantaneous. The, the wristband, if you've been to Disney World, if you've been to Disney World in the last few years, you know there's a magic band that you wear that has your room key and it has your um, your billing. You know that you, you all, all the billing, your credit card is attached, attached to that. They can also track you, you know, through the store if you have a lost child, or through the uh, park if you have a lost child, um, and they can track you to whatever extent. But that initially was supposed to be a great improvement for convenience. But you know who it was not an improvement for? The wait staff, the servers in, in a sit-down restaurant, because they had to make two trips back to you instead of just one to make that transaction happen. So not all Im improvement, not all innovations, innovative ideas actually are improvements, at least not for everybody, at least not all the time. Um, the in innovations that we talk about, and we, we have many conversations and many articles and uh, presentations that have been about what type of innovation are you looking for? The breakthrough, you know, the, the new thing, the, 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 the million dollar idea that nobody ever thought of, the, the next, you know, iPad uh, is that breakthrough. It's something new. It's something we didn't even know we had. But innovation is not just the, the new thing popping out of the cake. It, it's, there's incremental in innovation, taking the thing that you have already and making the next generation of it and making it better. The Automobile, you know, is the is the prime example. There, there, there's a car. It looks pretty much the same as it what as it did, you know, last year. But in this year, we have some innovative improvements that are going to make it appeal to the customer um, better. Make it make it uh, appeal more to to those customers. So I want to I want to get into the who. And I had a question pop up on the screen. Uh, Curtis, can teams be made up of one department, for instance, the quality department, or should others be involved? You've taken me right to where we want to go. There are types of people who will help to make those innovation projects or those innovation initiatives a reality. This is, the, this is very similar to the diagram I showed a second ago that said find an opportunity, connect it to a solution, make it user-friendly, and bring it to market. The creator in that same yellow circle is that person who comes up with a new idea. Just, you know, just something, I'm walking down the street, I see something and say, ooh, I've got an idea. I better hurry up and write it down. Now, I, for one, talking Tracy Owens, I come up with ideas all the time. I don't write them down. They are forgotten. They are, it's really a catastrophe. I, I really need to start carrying a notebook everywhere I go if I hadn't learned anything in all these years. But that's, a, that's just coming up with an idea. And I'm not saying, not, we are definitely not saying, and I'll show you the proof of this, that one person has to be the one idea generator and then pass everything off to everybody else. No, as a matter of fact, everyone comes up with ideas. Everyone has ideas. Many are reluctant to bring them to anyone's attention, uh, which we'll also cover here in just a second. 
the connector is the person who can take that idea, that um, you know, pane of glass, and say, now how can I turn this into a solution? What is it that we can actually do with it? Okay, that's a nifty idea, but what can we actually do with it? And that's where the sketch on the napkin or, this, or the um, you know, loose diagram of what this could look like will, will materialize. So there are creators and there are connectors in the creative phase. In the execution phase, there are developers. And this is, this is give me that napkin sketch and I'm going to turn it into a workable plan. And it's going to be uh, tested and proven and we're going to be able to do this and actually repeat it and bring value to our customers. And then that doer is the person who will not take no for an answer and who will absolutely bring it across the goal line. Well, these people, these, these types live in each one of us. We all have elements of this, but probably there is one to which each of us will gravitate uh, more strongly. And I'll show you how to uh, evaluate that. So can teams be made up of one department? Absolutely, yes. But any time a project begins, it is our strong recommendation and my, my absolute firsthand experience that when you can identify creators, connectors, developers, and doers and engage them all from the very beginning, you will find a lot fewer headaches later in your project. When you don't engage the doers and the, and the developers early, you're going to find roadblocks that were not anticipated during the creative phase. And if only developers and doers are in the, in the um, work cell, then possibly very few new ideas, refinements on what we have will happen, but new ideas may be hard to come by. I hope I presented at least a partial answer to that question. Let me continue on to this because I'm going to show you how to evaluate yourself. What do you like? Do you like creating opportunities, coming up with a new idea? Do you find yourself... Uh, coming up with a new idea all the time saying, oh, I got another great one. Oh, I got another great one. Linking those opportunities to, to solutions. And what I mean by that, and I'll cover this a little bit more in peripheral thinking here in a couple minutes, is when I see a person in one context doing something that I can, that I can uh, find a way to, to adapt that, or at least in my head, think of a way that will assimilate, that will say, you know, what that person's doing, we could maybe do that here and a little, with put a little different makeup on it, and it could be a solution for us. It might really work. And I'll give you a few examples during the second phase of this as well. Is it your preference to hammer the, the loose into the concrete, hammer the, uh, re refine the, the uh, abstract into the much more tightened, predictable? Is that your preference? Or do you like to deliver? Is delivery your real key? We have a self-assessment. I'm going to show you where it is, and you can take that, and we'd love for you to do it. When you do take that self-assessment, I'll show you the, the uh, URL for it in just a second. When you do take it, you're going to get a response. You're going to, you're going to find, now there are only seven questions here. I think we have uh, 15 sets of four. You're going to give each one a score. Each of the sentences in each row, um, you're going to give a score. Four for the one that's most like you, one for the one that's least like you, and then two and three also have to be interpolated. And it will calculate just, just simple uh, arithmetic. Actually, there's a little bit of waiting. Uh, it'll tell you what your style or your preferred style is. And the person on this screen has a 20 under developer, and that's the person who likes to connect a loose solution into a tight operating plan. But you'll see we're not giving zeros in any of these. You'll have some elements of all of them, right? We don't want to discount the, the idea that, that, that uh, someone might say, oh, I'm not creative. You know what? You are. Let's just explore it a little bit further. Are some people maybe more creative or at least more profusely willing to share their creativity than others? Yes. When you, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when you um, take this uh, self-assessment, and I'll show you where it is, you can encourage the other, oh, here's a question from, from Curtis. It's right, right in line with this. Identifying yourself is one thing, but how do you identify others and where they are? Have them take the assessment too. This is my advice. When the question is about your team or your project team, have them take the self-assessment and see where they come up. It would not even be a bad idea. I have walked through offices. I've walked through offices, and you may have also, where on someone's name tag is their Myers-Briggs type or their DISC type. And what is that for? That's to enable you to communicate with them more effectively, right? So you know how to approach them. Do I come to them with just the facts or would they like to make some chit chat first? Or should I give them evidence? Or will they just kind of believe me until we prove it later? It helps you. When you if you go through this self-assessment yourself, that's great. If you ask the members of your department or the members of your organization 
to please take that. And you, you as the pivot person for this, the quality manager, um, keep a record of that, then you have a good idea of who to invite to a new project team. That is, uh, I have done this. I pr I'm not just suggesting this as theory. I have done this. I've taken people who are creators, connectors, developers, and doers, um, and ask them to take this self-assessment, see if it's eye-opening for them. We do this at the World Conference every year, by the way, and I'll show you, I'll show you where, where, we, where to find that. But yes, not just you, ask others to take the self-assessment as well. Is that an okay answer, Curtis? Um, we have a little, bit of, a little bit more theory here. It's the ability to change, uh, to see change as an opportunity, not a threat. And then one of the, one of the additional outputs of that think tank in 2013 was that quality professionals need to insert themselves into innovation situations. How can you do that? I'll show you. The critical skills that this think tank came up with for innovators are listed here. You've got to be able to clearly define the problem. I'm sorry, who defines problems? Six Sigma black belts, Six Sigma master black belts, quality engineers, I mean, the quality auditors. I mean, you define what the problem is. We take pains to do that. Use your deductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning. Use the, you know, the context clues, the, the, um, the data points that build up into a conclusion or the conclusion that needs to be supported through data. We do that. Create a strong team. Do, do lean and Six Sigma practitioners, do quality managers, do managers of quality. Build teams, yes. Promote creativity, yes. We have six thinking hats and we have, you know, eight, um, um, what was that, oh, uh, crazy eights. We have all these, these tools that we learn to, to use to come up with new ideas, chiefly during the improve phase of a project, right? But this is not, those are not tools that are restricted to improvement projects. Keep conflict healthy. Don't we learn to moderate conflict? Build the value proposition. Isn't that the business case in a project charter? Explain innovation and deliver results. Do we not deliver results? These are skills that quality managers have, and they need to be explored, not just in the execution phase, but in creativity as well. And I'll show you some more about that. Uh, I keep making these promises, but if I, if I have the chance to get through my, whatever, 40 slides, I think you're going to be okay. Um, we want you to visit. You can, you can join us. We'd love to have you. Uh, the self-assessment is at that site. I'm going to show you how to find it here in just a second. I'm going to move to section two of this um, uh, presentation. During that, during sections two and three, I might refer to a couple of articles that I've been fortunate enough to get published in Quality Progress magazine. June 2012, I had the cover story up and away with my friend Caroline Fritz, uh, and that was about idea generation techniques. Then two years later, Nicole Radziwill and I put um, an article in the Quality Progress in January 2014, Fresh Perspective, which went deeper into uh, combinatory play and peripheral thinking and some more idea generation techniques. And then my most recent article was March of 2016, gosh, it's two years ago already, um, that was uh, the, that really will build section three of today's uh, workshop, which is about um, a few engine, a couple of engineering principles. I am not an engineer by education. I have a CQE, but not an engineer by education. Uh, that engineering principles that I have learned and adapted and have been really, really helpful in uh, improvement projects and innovation settings. So I'll refer to those articles here over the next, um, over the next half hour. Uh, peripheral thinking, I may have, if any of you were, was in uh, Florence at the inspection division conference two years ago in Florence, Kentucky, I did share some of this. I've updated it a little bit, but I, have, but I did share some of this material in, in Florence at the inspection division conference. Um, we, we have this, again, I'll remind you of the diagram. You've got to find the opportunity connected to a solution. There's a selection bubble in there where if there are ideas that are competing for attention, you know, if you have 10 or 12 or whatever ideas, but only the, amount, the, the resource available to support one or two of those, selection has to be made. And you can use your Pew matrix or your impact and effort matrix or a Rogers curve, you know, to figure out what they're going to be. I'm kind of glossing over that part during this session. And then the red and the blue are about the execution phase. Well, we are focused more on the creative phase at, uh, for, for this, for the time being. Where do you, let me ask you, and if you put an answer into the um, uh, chat to this question, I would love to see it. And I do see that there is a question about developing or improving your strength, and I have a few suggestions at the end of these black uh, slides uh, for Andrew. Um, where do you come up with your best ideas? Where do you come up with your best ideas? When you have a great idea, where were you when it, when it happened? Were you at your desk? 
like our like our executive there on the top left? Were you in the car? Oh my goodness, sometimes being in the car is where you come up with those great ideas. And of course, I don't have a pencil. Or in the tub, in the shower, it's frequently referred to as this is that idea I came up with in the shower. Of course, you know, you draw it in the uh, steam on the glass, and then it just fades away. Walking the dog, all places, you know, these are, these are great answers. Keep them, keep them coming. I would like to see where you have your great ideas. It is not often enough that your good ideas happen when you need it, right? Your good ideas will often happen when you don't, when you, when you are not in that sort of context. I'm going to talk about this for just a second, and this is going to sound, I mean, it might sound a little bit hokey, but it is, it really, really works. I am a pretty rational person, and I'll tell you, this really works. This is a labyrinth. Um, a labyrinth, if you're not familiar, a labyrinth is like a maze, but it's, uh, it's, it's different in one extremely important way. In a labyrinth, there are no choices that need to be made. There is never a time in a labyrinth where you have to say, hmm, should I go straight or should I turn right? Never. There is one path in and one path only. So you don't have to think about the rules. You don't have to think about where you're going, right? In the labyrinth, you're able to explore, uh, oh, I, you know, I, maybe, I, maybe I pulled one of the diagrams out, but you're familiar with the concept of right brain and left brain. Um, I'm not a biologist either, but your uh, left brain is the one that's all about rules, following the rules, the concrete sequential. The left brain works on what are the rules and how can I follow them or how can I choose not to. The right brain is creativity. The right brain is you know, the abstract, the random, the new idea. Where do we live most of our lives? The answer and you can type it in the chat, but it's going to say left, 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 left. I mean, we're quality managers. We work in corporations. You know, we have, to, we have certain mores of behavior. We spend most of our time in our left brain. The right brain is, is um, after kindergarten, which is part of my uh, Up and Away article from 2012. After kindergarten, they all start chipping away at our right brain, start locking us into left brain, start locking us into rules. The labyrinth is the place to let your creativity flow. Uh, I first learned about it at the Pittsburgh um, World Conference in 2000, help me, 2010, 2011, 2011 was Pittsburgh. Thank you, Jim. 2011, Pittsburgh, uh, the committee, conference committee set up a masking tape labyrinth in one quiet corner of the David Lawrence Convention Center. It wasn't, wasn't as big as this on the screen, this nice lacquered floor. And there are, there are bigger and there are smaller. Uh, but the idea is think about what you want to think about and then enter the labyrinth. And when you do, can you see on this screen that the entrance to this labyrinth is at the top, uh, the 12 o'clock position, way, the farthest away from the photographer, that you enter and you walk in and you follow the path. And it's a sinewy path. And it will get you tantalizingly close to the center right at the beginning. But oh no, you've got about 10 more minutes of walking to do before you get to the middle. And those 10 minutes, your left brain is effectively shut off. As long as there are no other distractions, um, you know, facing you, if, if you, you've got you know, one person in, you know, one person in line and people aren't trying to clamor past you on the labyrinth or walk over it. But if you follow that path, your left brain is able to shut off and your right brain can flourish. I did this in 2011 at the Pittsburgh conference. I thought I was a new consultant. I just, I had become a consultant about a year earlier. Um, I was thrown into it, and so I didn't have uh, a whole lot of planning. And so I thought, I need ways to market myself. I need, how to, I need the ways to market myself as a consultant and get more attention. And that's what I thought about on my 10-minute journey in, you know, a minute or two kind of standing in the middle, and then my 10-minute journey back out. And I came up with two new ideas. I put them into play, and they really helped me. Would I have thought of those ideas anyway? Maybe, but not that day. Right. That day, my creativity was was uh, was overflowing because of that labyrinth. And there are labyrinths all around. There's a website, labyrinthlocator.com. Uh, you can find one near you. It, it sounds and I feel sometimes like I sound hokey, like this is a divining rod and we're looking for some magic, you know, potion. But it really does work. And the, in fact, the idea for my um, bridge article, uh, Propel Forward, came from a trip through a labyrinth. Uh, so peripheral thinking is our topic. And it is it is finding an idea from something that's going on in a context other than your own, looking to another source unrelated to your current situation and finding a solution there. I'll tell you what I mean. I have a friend 
Uh, he lives here in Dublin also. He's a serial entrepreneur. His name is Jim Mazotis. I referred to him in the, um, uh, the uh, Fresh Perspective article. And he has, he's come up with several you know, products, launched them, sold them. One day, and he has two young kids. I mean, they're less young now than they used to be, but I've known him for a long time. And when his kids were quite young, they were at the beach. And he was looking at the beach, and it was a crowded beach, and he and his wife were there. And he noticed that the kids were intermittently you know, playing beach stuff, you know, sand and surf, and playing with their electronic devices. And he thought, for a second, he lost sight of Alex, his, his younger son. And he thought about, well, now this is, a, this is a big potential mess right here. There's so many people out here. How would I find him if he were missing? And he thought about the device. He said, you know what, maybe I could locate that. And this is in the early years. I think it was before, um, what was it, Life360 didn't, wasn't out at the, at the time. Uh, but he came up with an app, and it's a different one than Life360. It's called Safe, uh, Safe House. And he said what, what he can do from his master phone is turn on everything on his kid's device. He could turn on the microphone. He could turn on the camera. He can disable it from being turned off you know, from his master device. So wherever that kid is, you can use the clues uh, the, the, of course, the GPS, the locator, but also the camera, the microphone to hear and see what's going on around them and locate that, that kid. And it came from a, a trip to the beach. You can take your team uh, to new levels of creativity by, by um, using peripheral thinking. Uh, the, I had a um, situation with a call center. Uh, where I used to work with at, a, at AIG um, in Delaware. And the call center supervisors, call center supervisors are, are almost always somebody who was a call center agent, did a great job, demonstrated the penchant for leadership, and was promoted, right? So they used to be on the phone all day, and now they are on the phone infrequently, and they are on the phone normally when? When does a supervisor actually get on the phone with a customer? If you're typing fast, the answer is escalation. <laughs> when 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 that that uh, customer is irate, get me a supervisor right now. So they get on the phone and they're already you know trying to talk them down from the ledge. It's almost always negative experiences. Well, that was hurting the morale of these supervisors in this call center, and there were many. It was a large call center, so these supervisors, each of which had had you know eight to twelve agents, they were getting called to the phone only in these negative. Uh, circumstances. So we had a workshop. Uh, we said, what can we do to improve this morale? And one of the one of the supervisors had a friend who is a police officer right up the road in the city of Chadsford, Pennsylvania, right up the road from Wilmington. And that police officer and 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 this uh, call center supervisor were, were were talking one day, and the police officer said, we yeah we have a metric in our department. What are your metrics? We have a metric in our department. It's called exposures. And what that means is how many times do we actually interact with a citizen in that community? Interaction and exposure could be helping to get a cat out of a tree or giving somebody directions. It could be giving somebody a ticket, you know, a speeding ticket or, or something, but whatever it was, interacting. And they wanted them to interact during their shift with 10. They wanted to have 10 exposures per day, per shift, right? Because they could sit in their car and they could write reports and they could talk, you know, do some research, whatever. But they wanted them out, you know, talking to the people. So we thought, how can we adapt this? It sounds pretty positive. And we did. We adapted it in the call center to say, whenever a new insurance product is rolled out in a particular state, anytime somebody calls from that state, the agent is to ask, hey, do you mind if my supervisor talks to you for just a second about this new product? A lot of times they'd say no, but when they did, the supervisor was a, able to actually have a more pleasant conversation, one that was um, not just shooting the breeze, but also asking them something interesting about something useful, gathering data about the new product in the insurance uh, business. So we used that and we adapted it from the police officer in right, a different setting. I'm going to go a little quickly, quickly through this next um, uh, couple of examples. Oops, did I lose it? No, we're okay. Um, so what you, what you can do, and this is, um, I'm starting to address uh, the question about can you develop or improve your creator, connector, developer, or doer role. For individuals, what we prescribe on this creativity side, on the creator, connector side, is a couple, are a couple of things. One, you can subscribe to a journal that is not typical for you. 
there are ideas in there. And even though you may, may initially be either opposed or ambivalent to them, somebody else's point of view can open your eyes to a new possibility. You know, if you're, um, I don't know, if you're a Republican, read an issue of Rolling Stone. <laughs> if, you're, if you're more liberal, you know, get a, get a, a Wall Street Journal and see, see what they have to say, uh, just as a couple of examples. But you can read Cat Fancy or Motorcycle Digest, you know, something and, and read an article because what we're talking about is getting ideas from somewhere else. You can certainly walk the labyrinth. You can take the self-assessment to see where you are. I'll show you now where this, I've been promising you where this is. Our website is, um, uh, it's asq.org slash innovation hyphen group. I don't know if the URL shows on this screen, but it might, I might have it, uh, I might have it um, later. Oh, I had it up above. So if this presentation is posted, Jair, um, then everybody will be able to see our URL. Anyway, it's asq.org slash innovation hyphen group, because we used to be an interest group before we were promoted to a division. And on the left side under innovation information is the link to our self-assessment. Take you less than five minutes to do, unless you really put a lot of thought into it, and then it might take eight or nine. And you'll come out with your um, preference. It's really your preference. Uh, and you can, can you manipulate the survey? Definitely, yes. But try to answer honestly, because no one benefits from uh, from that. This is the uh, quick response code that will take you directly to uh, a mobile version of the survey. Uh, if you're able to, I'll leave this up here for a second. If you want to take a screenshot or actually snap it with your phone right now, it will take you to a mobile version of the uh, self-assessment. We use this in, um, in uh, where were we this year? It was in Milwaukee. It wasn't Charlotte. It was, come on. Seattle, holy cow, why did I forget that? Uh, in the Seattle uh, conference, you know, we were able to get people uh, to take a lot of these uh, self-assessments during that time. About 250 people took it while they were at the conference. So that's for individuals. Action plan for teams, mix your team. Creators, connectors, developers, doers. Uh, mix that team, make sure that people are uh, working uh, in the create, creative and execution phases throughout the project so you don't get any rude awakening later on with a surprise that was unanticipated. Uh, taking a trip, you know, not necessarily to the beach, but uh, one, of the, one of my other stories, and I'll keep this short, was about a, um, a team that was having trouble responding to lead time. Their lead time was too long for products when orders were placed. And they went out to dinner. They, just, they, were, at a, they were at kind of a, an impasse, and they went out to dinner. And they went to one of those um, restaurants where the concept is an open kitchen, you could see into the kitchen. That's very popular now. Uh, and so they were, they were kind of talking and looking. And what they noticed was that they kept, the, the kitchen staff kept some pasta in a few, a few different types of pasta, bite-sized pasta and a long noodle, on rolling boil in the front, right at the front, so that when an order was placed for pasta, they didn't have to wait the 14 minutes for the fettuccine to cook that they were able to have partially cooked you know, fettuccine already and just blast it into um, edibility on short notice. And if the pasta got bad, you know, they tossed it. But what is, you know, what is pasta? It's not the most expensive thing back in the kitchen. And what they said was, that's what we need to do. We need to have part of our product manufactured and then finish it when the order is placed. And to be specific, they built the case of the, of the device, but didn't add the labeling or the electrical cord until the order was placed because they didn't know if the next order was going to you know, somewhere in the United States or Japan or Europe or somewhere where the plug might be different and the instructions might have to be written in, the label might have to be written in a different language. So they actually built the case and saved the finishing touches for when the order was placed. Uh, and that was, I mean, that was extremely positive for them. So I'm going to close section two and move into section three of this. We're doing good on time at 20 till the hour. Uh, this is what arose from a trip through a labyrinth. I, I admittedly, I was walking through a labyrinth. And what I thought was, how, what I was thinking of, how are we going to attract people to help us build an innovation body of knowledge? How are we going to do that? How are we going to attract people to, to share their knowledge with us? And I thought, well, innovation is a little bit like going from where you are to where you want to be. And in that regard, it's like a bridge. And so I'm walking through the labyrinth thinking this is the, these thoughts are coming to me rapidly. This labyrinth is an outdoor uh, labyrinth through bushes. So I had a closed-toed shoes on, you know, and I was, I was ready. And I thought this is, a, this is a bridge. But the bridge that you're building to the other side of whatever this chasm or river is, 
it's going to go if you if you if it goes perfectly straight that's fine but there are times and you've seen bridges that actually have a curve in the middle uh san mateo and i mean there there are bridges that where, where it curves and did they mean for it to curve was that the plan or did they encounter something along the way that caused them to reroute the bridge uh, so I did a little study, and I, I, I reached out to a couple of engineer um, friends of mine, and I've worked among a lot of engineers, and many of you are engineers or know them. And I, and I said, I said what, is, what is this that I'm on to? Am I on to something at all? And so here's what came out of it. This is in two phases. The first part is about improvement. The second part is about innovation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about all-wheel drive. I'll keep it short, and then move into bridge building, actual bridge building. Uh, with all-wheel drive, you might have an all-wheel drive vehicle, both axles get power. Both axles get power. Uh, and there, is, there are two possible, where well, there are three possibilities, three possibilities. One is that both axles were manufactured with the same ratios, the same gear ratios, the same, um, and they will move at the same speed. So as you move through the gears, as you move through the speeds, those axles spin at exactly the same rate. And that's, that's perfectly fine. They spin at the same rate. Uh, when I worked at the Kenworth Truck Company, we didn't make axles. We bought axles from Eaton and Meritor and you know some European companies, Sisu, and and we um, sometimes the axle ratio would be exactly the same, and sometimes it would not be the same for a front drive uh, front drive axle. So there are two possibilities there. Either if they're if, as long if they're not moving at the same speed, you're either going to have the front axle moving a little bit faster, or the rear axle moving a little bit faster. So I asked my friend Brian Linger, the engineer, which is better. Which is, which is better, have the front axle moving a little bit faster. And still, it's got to be within 1% or the whole thing is going to fall apart. But they still have to be within 1% of each other. But to have the front or the or rear moving a little bit faster. So in this diagram, the truck is moving to the right, car, the vehicle is moving to the right, and the rear axle is a little bit faster than the front axle. And the result of that is compression. The rear axle is spinning faster. It's actually pushing itself into the vehicle. And if it pushes too much over a period period of time, the front axle is going to start bouncing. Uh, and that's going to compress the whole system. And that is a bad thing. Where instead, if the front axle, if you choose uh, an axle pairing where the front axle moves a little bit faster, it actually stretches the vehicle, pulls the rear axle along the littlest bit. Tension is the name for this condition. And that's a good thing. You actually even, even um, achieve a small little fuel economy benefit as well. It's, not, it's hardly noticeable, but over time, it, it can be. So tension and compression are these, um, these concepts that are in combat with each other, tension and compression in, in engineering, from what I've learned from engineering. And you can correct me. Please start typing vigorously into the chat or the QA if I've got something wrong. But this has held past muster so far. So what we're talking about is keep the front axle moving faster. So how does this work in process improvement? If I've got a dis I'm not going to talk about customer support right now in this little diagram. I've got order entry and fulfillment. Entry of the order and the fulfillment of that order. They're both broken. Both of those uh, components of my process are broken. Which one should I fix first? Well, if I fix order entry first, which is it's, it's, it's a strong temptation because it's the one that the customer is involved in right there. You know, that we, we got to fix that part. We got to make the order entry go really well. But what we're going to do if we fix order entry first, is push these new orders, maybe more, maybe even more new orders into a dysfunctional fulfillment process. That is putting compression on our system, putting compression on our system and it's bad. So instead, if we turn it around, turn it around, well, I, I, I left the diagram out, but um, if we fix fulfillment first, fix the back end first, fix the infrastructure first, then when we do go back to, um, to make improvements to the front end, we'll be ready for it. Now, I worked at an organization recently where the customer's user interface had to be sexy and it had to keep up with the competitor and it had to be you know, fast and, and lucid and, and it was great, but the back office was not ready for it. It was, the, it was backward and we suffered for years trying to catch up on the fulfillment side, right, on the implementation side. So our advice uh, in this case is, Make the, front, make the front axle go faster. Fix the second part of the process first. So now I get into the bridges. When you have a bridge, and this is a bridge, uh, commonly, uh, I guess not a lot of cars drive over a bridge like this anymore. Or maybe, maybe, maybe it's been a long time since the cars, but the trains still grow across truss bridges, iron truss bridges. And each of the members, each of the steel, you, you'll, you'll, 
I beams with webs and flanges are, are are what these are being built from. Each of the members is going to have a load. When a load is placed on this bridge, it's either going to be in tension mode or compression mode. And what I mean by that, if you're not familiar with this concept or if it's if I haven't explained it very well, if you're holding a pencil, if you have a pencil near you, hold the pencil and put both hands on the pencil and push it with your thumbs, push the middle of the pencil with your thumbs as if to break it, as if to snap that pencil. Don't break your pencil, but just push it so you can see it start to bend. When that pencil bends, the molecules in that pencil that are close to your thumbs are in compression mode. They're actually getting squeezed closer together microscopically, but they are being squeezed closer together. And the molecules that are away from your thumbs, away from you, are in tension mode. They're actually being stretched. All right, so compression is squeezed and tension is stretched. So how does this work? When you build the bridge, in, in this one, those that are um, red are going to be stretched when a load crosses this bridge. And those that are uh, green are going to be compressed. Now it is, as I understand steel engineering, it is easier to build a steel member that's going to be in tension mode. You can stretch a steel member at, without compromising the integrity of the steel. But compression requires a more stout member or it's going to buckle. The, compression, the members that are going to be in compression mode when a load is placed on that bridge need to be sturdier than those that will be in tension. And that got me thinking, this is just like people. This is just like people. There are people who are going to be compressed during a change. And there are going to be people who are stretched during a change. Right? And both of those kind of sound negative at, at times. But the stretch means this is a person who wants to do more, who's leaning forward, who's ready to, ready to take on additional responsibility. That's the tension member. It's also funny that member is the steel you know, beam on this bridge, but it's also your team member. Right? Some members are going to be compressed also. So what do you do? You prepare for where that bridge is going to go. There are times, and I learned this from, from Charlie Gorman, who was a Bethlehem steel engineer for almost 40 years. There are members of the, on this bridge that will later be in tension, but during construction will be in compression. Can you, can you picture what I'm saying? That during the construction, more weight will be placed in a different way on that bridge until it reaches the other side, until the span is complete, the bridge, the, that, that member may be used for a different purpose. And there are different ways around that. You can build false works. You can reinforce that, that steel. You can, um, there are different ways to, to address that. But in a project team, how do we address that? Right? We want to take that, that we want to prepare for the final result. And don't we always do that? When you're running a project, uh, we have this innovation. We look at stakeholder management, don't we? And we say, this is a stakeholder who is um, you know, in favor of the change. And this is a stakeholder who is neutral. And this is a stakeholder who is maybe opposed. And we want to change their, uh, uh, where they're going. Because when this change is, is finished, here's where we need them to be. We need them to be positive or at least neutral. But during the project, during the change, we can lose them. We can actually lose somebody who is in favor. And you have to be ready for that. right? So sometimes we'll want to get somebody who is uh, opposed and try to win them over by, by, by you know, somehow incentivizing them, making them part of a team, uh, uh, getting them to, um, to play an important role. And there are some others, and you know them, you know in your organization there are some others who will be a little bit like a, like a loose cannon rolling around the deck of a ship. They're going to be like, oh, let's go, let's go charge them on. You may actually have to slow some of them down. Uh, so what do you do? This is what, what I've called the tension and compression chart. It's on stakeholder analysis. And I don't have animation on this, but behind this is a regular stakeholder analysis saying, where are they? Where are they going to be? But if you add a little TC element to it, a little tension compression, meaning how am I going to best employ this person during the implementation? Not just at the end. How do I need them to be at the end? But during, is there somebody that I have to slow down? Is there somebody that I would like to speed up? Are there groups that I'd like to get together? You know, that's a way for you to uh, to help stretch somebody who, who is, who's ready to stretch and maybe compress somebody a little bit when, when they need to be. And further, one more, little, one more little thing about tension and compression, and that is in the context of testing. When you test um, your solutions, 
when you test your solutions, you want to put them through vigorous, you know, simulated testing, at least conference room pilot, uh, design of experiments, you know, at, at, at most, to actually simulate the, the real world and what's going to happen. When you over-test, when you test exhaustively, you know, uh, too much, that is like compression. That is making the stoutest, you know, the strongest test possible, and it's, and it's, it's not unlikely that that solution will not reach the market when you wanted it to because it's going through too much uh, testing. And if you test insufficiently, then the, the, there could be danger, right? They could break. So somewhere in the middle, you know, is the balance. Somewhere in the middle is the, is the leverage where you say, oh, we, we have just enough to test. And of course, we have formulas, um, you know, to minimize uh, alpha and beta risk that will tell you this is exactly where we need to be. But we're suggesting to put a little tension, a little tension on your test results. Maybe test a little less, as long as you can still have reliable results, rather than over testing rather than over simulating in order for it to be perfect now of course if it's life and death if you're in pharmaceuticals if you're in you know um, landing airplanes um, providing power to hospitals you're going to want to be extra safe but when you're launching that product whether it's a minimally viable product um, you know or the next generation if you put a little bit of attention trust your test results get the product out a little faster you can accelerate the pace of innovation this is the conclusion of my uh, session, and I want to ask if there are any questions you'd like to pop into the chat panel. Uh, and in the meantime, I will turn this back to Jair to go over a couple more inspection division notes. I am watching the question and answer pane. Thanks a lot, Tracy, for opening up the questions. Uh, participants, if you have any questions, feel free to post them. Tracy is kind enough to answer some of those questions. I just would like to give a little plug to our 2018 Inspection Division Conference and invite you all to join us in Memphis, Tennessee, October 18th through the 19th. We're going to have two great keynote speakers, four tours, four workshops, six pre-conference courses, 16 conference sessions, multiple, multiple exhibitors. And this is a great, fantastic way to network and get to meet you all in person, and you get to meet us as well. So we hope that you have time and are free to join us. We're also going to be having uh, some three-day courses if you want to come in, prepare for some of your CQ2 exam, CQA, or some yellow belt prep courses. We're also going to offer a two-day courses on CQI exam prep, fundamental GD and T, and measurement uncertainty. Oh, I'm sorry. Please feel free to web visit our website, ASQ Inspection Division, and learn more about our conference coming up in October. So we're looking at the chat, hoping that um, somebody might have a question or two. If not, then uh, we'll, we'll be closing the, the session soon. Uh, I do want to thank Tracy Owens for his time and sharing his knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, this will be uh, receiving our use. So within 24 hours, you, you will be receiving credits for attending this webinar. We're uh, going to give maybe a minute or two to see if uh, there's any questions. Did you say, Jay, that this is, this is recorded and that the slides are available, will be available? Yes. So the event is being recorded, and we are going to post it on Inspection Division website. You, you might have to give us a, a little bit of time to get that because of some, just some transitional with uh, technical difficulties, posting things to our website. But um, I'm hoping that we could get this going by this week, and I, I will be uh, letting you know, Tracy, once it's up and running, that way you could go ahead and, and let any folks that are interested in, in viewing this later on, they could go ahead and go into our website and view it. That's great that it's available to everybody, yes. Uh, thank you, and because I did get a couple of questions just now saying, um, uh, you know, where will the slides be and, and can we have access to them, so that's very good. Uh, I did get another question just a second ago on the process of innovation, like like a little bit more about the process of innovation, and the, and the I went to um, refer to the circle diagram that we had at the beginning that was um, find the find this uh, opportunity, find an opportunity, which is that that spark that um, you know I just saw this um, I don't know, the spinning element in a vacuum cleaner, and I'm wondering if I can't use that in my paint factory, you know something like 
whatever that is. And then the, then the connecting it to a solution is that, okay, if we use it in the paint factory, how is that going to work? Are we going to be able to, uh, uh, you know, locate it, at, um, you know, where, where our current machines are and how, how are we going to be able to, uh, you know, to generate enough force for that? And then, so that becomes a sketch. Now, if you have a suggestion box posted in your um, office uh, or, or, your, or your building, um, th some people will put ideas in there and some people will not. So an important component to getting people's responses, getting people's ideas, is creating an environment where, where they feel safe in doing that and they also feel like it's worth their while. Not that, you have to, not that every idea is going to turn into a project, but every idea should le at least be acknowledged. A couple of companies ago, there was um, a program where if you sent this idea through, it was called the Big Idea. I think it was called the Big Idea. And of course, there was the obligatory light bulb on it, um, you know, that, that you got a pen you know, at least a pen, if not a phone call, you know, from the chair. And that's, that's, that's great. It's, you know, doing something to acknowledge. Uh, please go to, and I, I know my time is running down, and I got a couple more questions um, to answer, but please go to my uh, articles. And I'm, I don't get, you know, I don't get a whole lot of feedback from my articles. But if you go to the, to the um, June 2012 Quality Progress, that's about idea generation. And if you go to uh, the January 2014 uh, Fresh Perspective. That's about idea generation um, as well. I'm reminded also, I'm reminded of the um, uh, quality improvement prongs from Deming. You know, in, innovation, it plays an important role. Innovation in product and service, innovation in, in process. You know, and improvements, as I mentioned, some improvements are innovative and, and some are just making, just doing the job better. Um, but innovation, and by the way, if any of you is a Baldrige examiner, the, the, I think the third most frequently occurring word in the whole Baldrige criteria, other than you know, A and V and the prepositions, is innovation. I mean, there's performance, there's excellence, and then there's innovation. And it is, it is, a, it is a prominent, prominent role. Um, does innovation approach change if the expected development time is very long? The, okay, thank you for the question. There is, um, there's always a danger in long projects, whether it's an improvement or an innovation. There's always a danger in long projects because of turnover of team members, losing, losing uh, visibility to that uh, project or that priority, uh, changing organizational you know, voice of the business. So our advice, again, wherever possible, is to subdivide the project into bite-sized pieces. But, uh, break the project, uh, the overall implementation, the overall new product introduction, break it down into its bite-sized pieces. If there needs to be a long project, when, when you break it into the, its component pieces that can be resolved in a shorter amount of time, and, and everything about Agile, um, you know, everything about Agile uh, development, and it's not just restricted to software. I've used Agile at universities um, uh, in, in development departments. I mean, Agile is about a, a two-week sprint. What can we get done in this two-week time? And you get runs on the board and you keep the attention of the executives and the team members. So that is, that is again, that's our advice. Uh, I, got, I got one more question. I think I have about 30 seconds. Innovation teams are dependent on the quality of the organizational culture, aren't they? Whether they can promote innovation or not. Um, this is, okay. This is a very intriguing question. Let me, re let, me, let me repeat it. Innovation teams are dependent on the organizational culture. Well, they are, but how do you change organizational culture, right? You change organizational culture by changing habits, and you change habits by changing behaviors. Again, breaking it down, breaking culture down into habits, which goes down into behaviors, you can pave the way. If you get people... Uh, um, uh, con creators, connectors, developers, doers onto project teams, you show results, you promote a safe environment where people are willing to contribute their ideas and they don't feel like they're going to be, um, you know, on a spotlight or a threat um, and create that safe environment, that will start turning the ship and turning that organizational culture. And I'm not just talking from theory, I'm talking from reality. I've worked at organizations and I've consulted for organizations where we've been successful and some where we've been less successful. And the common thread is do something, do one discrete thing, make it a win, and you start to get that positive attention. I hope that's a satisfactory response. Jair, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Tracy. Uh, well, it's time to end today's program. Thank you once again to Tracy Owens and to each and every one of you for participating today. We wish you well. Hope you will stay in touch. And with that, we say goodbye for today.